Well, thanks very much for joining us. And I do want to uh, acknowledge that the debate is ongoing in the House of Representatives on the condolence motion for Peter Murphy. And so it's a very difficult day for the Labor family in particular, but I think uh, across this parliament, uh, Peter Murphy is someone who is very broadly respected as a woman of courage, intellect, integrity and character. And so there is uh, a sadness across uh, this parliament, and I know that that goes uh, beyond just uh, parliamentarians across the political spectrum. It also goes to uh, many uh, staff and people who, who knew Peter. So I do want to acknowledge that. Um, we have had a very successful meeting of the National Cabinet. Uh, this year, we have advanced reforms in housing, in health and in skills, uh, with the first skills agreement uh, for 10 years uh, moving forward. And today we have prioritised what we said at the beginning of the year would be our major priority of health reform. Today we're taking immediate action to take pressure off hospitals through further strengthening Medicare, but we're also locking in long-term structural health reform. Today we're securing the future of the NDIS for this and future generations. In addition to the agreement that we've reached on the National Firearms Registry, which really takes the reforms that began under the Howard government and completes those reforms by allowing uh, police uh, to be able to have access to the information that they need. And it comes, of course, uh, just before the first anniversary of the tragedy that we saw uh, in Queensland last year. Health was our number one priority, and I want to run through the reforms that have been agreed to today, and they are substantial, so I apologise in advance. Strengthening Medicare. First Ministers have agreed to a further $1.2 billion package of strengthening Medicare measures to take pressure off our hospital system. These measures, uh, which came from uh, the, uh, the CAF process from states and territories to request of the Commonwealth, uh, have been agreed to. They'll grow and support our health workforce while reducing unnecessary presentations to emergency departments. The Commonwealth will fund and implement with states and territories the health-related recommendations from the CRUC review. Uh, they're very much focused on workforce issues and the workforce that we need to deliver the health care that Australians deserve. Secondly, we'll have a further boosting of Medicare urgent care clinics. And thirdly, support for older Australians through avoided hospital admission and earlier discharge from hospitals. Importantly, Australians want an approach to health care that recognises that primary care and hospital care are linked and that we need to strengthen primary care in order to take pressure off hospitals. But they need both. National Cabinet has endorsed the Commonwealth in increasing the National Health Reform Agreement contributions to 45 per cent over a maximum of a 10-year path from the 1st of July 2025, with an achievement of at least 42.5 uh, per cent before 2030. So today we've agreed effectively on the parameters of the next two five-year health agreements. This provides certainty for state and territory governments to be able to deliver the health care that they want. National Cabinet endorsed the current 6.5 per cent funding cap being replaced by a more generous approach that applies a cumulative cap over that period 2025 to 2030. And this includes a first year catch up growth premium as well, because we know that there's a need for a continued focus on addressing elective surgery. Uh, health ministers will commence the renegotiation of the National Health Reform Agreement, addendum to embed long term system wide structural health reforms, including uh, that of the NHRA mid term review findings. Uh, these reforms will make a very significant difference 
to the health care that Australians need and deserve. National Cabinet also acknowledged the need for reforms to secure the future of the NDIS, ensuring it can continue to provide life-changing support to future generations of Australians with a disability. Governments all noted the forthcoming release of the final report of the independent NDIS review that was co-led by Professor Bonnie Haiti and Lisa Paul. As an additional response to the NDIS review, National Cabinet agreed to work together to implement legislative and other changes to the NDIS to improve the experience of participants and restore the original intent of the scheme to support people with permanent and significant disability with a broader ecosystem of supports. To adjust state and territory NDIS contribution escalation rates, increasing from 4% to be in line with actual scheme growth, capped at 8%, with the Commonwealth paying the remainder of the scheme costs growth commencing from the 1st of July 2028. The National Cabinet agreed to jointly design additional foundation supports to be jointly commissioned by the Commonwealth and the States with the work oversighted by the First Secretary's group. In addition, the Council of Federal Financial Relations, that is the Treasurer's, uh, will oversight costs of the reforms and report to National Cabinet. An initial tranche of legislation will be introduced into the Commonwealth Parliament in the first half of 2024, with rule changes phased in as developed. The delivery of foundational supports would look to be delivered through existing government service settings where appropriate, such as childcare and schools, phased in over time, and funding would be agreed through new federal funding arrangements with additional costs split 50-50, with final details to be settled uh, through uh, the Treasurer's meeting. Uh, the Commonwealth agreed to cap an additional expenditure for states and territories on new foundational disability services to ensure that the com combination of the health costs and disability costs will see all states and territories better off. These commitments demonstrate government's ongoing commitment to the NDIS. Discussions with the disability community will continue over the coming months as we work together to make the positive changes needed for people with a disability. On the GST No Worse Off Guarantee, National Cabinet has agreed to extend the GST No Worse Off Guarantee in its current form for three years, from 2027-28. This ensures that GST proceeds are shared fairly and equitably and it provides, importantly, funding certainty for the states when they're doing their budget. National Cabinet's priority is safeguarding service delivery, and this will do that. I referred to the National Firearms Register in, uh, in my beginning. Uh, this register will be a federated model, state data connecting with a central hub data allowing near real-time information sharing across the country and the Commonwealth will assist states and territories with funding the reforms which will provide enduring benefits for many years to come. National Cabinet agreed to work together to ensure the register is fully operational within four years. National Cabinet was also briefed by the AFP Commissioner Rhys Kershaw and the Acting Australian Border Force Commissioner Kayleen Zakharov on Operation Aegis and the close cooperation that is occurring between the Commonwealth and State and Territory Law Enforcement. Uh, this was a very successful meeting uh, following a successful uh, discussion that we had last night. And I think that the combination of the immediate measures on health, the long-term 10-year agreement on health, lifting up the Commonwealth contribution to hospitals at the same time as we're boosting and strengthening Medicare, along with the measures to secure the future of NDIS, uh, mean that we end 2023, uh, showing that federal-state relations can truly be har harmonised and harnessed in a way that benefits our entire constituency, no matter which state or territory you live in. And I do want to thank uh, the spirit of the, uh, the uh, premiers and chief ministers. I want to welcome the new premier. I think this is your, your first meeting. 
uh, here, uh, and it has been a very successful one. Phil Curry. Sure. Foundational uh, support services. So, are you saying they'll be hived off from the NDIS and funded under a separate arrangement, a 50 50 arrangement with the states using schools and childcare centres? And will that just apply to new cases or will it be existing cases under the NDIS? Will they be grandfathered under the NDIS? Now, what we're saying is that if you, uh, at the moment, NDIS funding is agreed by everyone. Uh, including the review, to be unsustainable. What we want to do, though, is to make sure that the principles in which the NDIS was established, that those people who need that support continue to get it. But for uh, others, it might be that they don't need the full NDIS, NDIS scheme into the future. So we're still talking about growth here of an 8% growth rate but for foundational supports, we recognise uh, that uh, for uh, support to be given in a, a school or childcare uh, setting, uh, there may well be additional costs uh, for the states, and uh, that will be shared 50-50 uh, between the Commonwealth and the states. Uh, we have agreed on a cap on that for the states, because we think that when you look at the review that you'll get to see pretty soon. Uh, I think Bill Shorten's speaking at the National Press Club tomorrow. Um, you'll see that in a range of areas there it is very, very possible and indeed necessary for costs to be reduced. Not in terms of the support that people need, but in terms of bureaucracy and some of the businesses that have been established and some of the uh, structures which are there. Those already getting support from the NDIS for foundational supports, will they be moved to the new system or will it just no, be no. The new? That, that foundational support is already there. What we're saying is there might be in the future uh, additional foundation support and we want to work with the states and territories to make sure that we, we share that path going forward. Andrew. Uh, Prime Minister. Um, on Welcome the... back. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Nice to be back. Um, on the uh, extending the GSD deal yep. uh, for another three years, it's obviously the cost has blown out considerably um, in, over the past five years. Uh, what is the estimated cost of that exten extension? And perhaps um, we could ask the Premier to justify its continuation. Uh, the, this was uh, a, an agreement uh, that was reached by the former government. Uh, to not extend, and it's one that uh, my government has said that we remain committed to providing uh, the support that was agreed uh, with Western Australia. Um, going forward, going forward, the, the costs are around about um, three and a half billion dollars per year for extension, around about, um, and uh, we think that. Uh, for states and territories to be able to have their certainty to provide service provision, including across their forward estimates. Uh, this is a request from the states and territories. It was discussed by the Treasurers uh, last Friday, and it's one that uh, we've agreed to today. David? I have a question on infrastructure and whether that came up in today's meeting, because that's been a source of strains with the states, and in particular, a question for uh, the Queensland Premier uh, on this as well. Does the GST outcome here alleviate your concerns about any cuts to infrastructure projects in Queensland and any cut in funding? Yeah. Well, uh, I'll make uh, two points there. Uh, one is there's been no cut in federal infrastructure funding. We said the $120 billion stays. And with regard to specific projects going forward, uh, there will continue to be dialogue as there, there is about uh, on a bilateral basis because you have to have an, a, an infrastructure agreement on a path forward uh, between the Commonwealth and each of the states and territories. Uh, so it, it did come up and we've agreed to continue to have those discussions about projects. Uh, what, what we couldn't continue to do is to have uh, projects uh, which had 
$50 million or $100 million allocated for them in some cases of the 800 projects that had added up, some of which that were announced prior to the 2016 election, where a hole hadn't been dug yet, where there was no agreement by states and territories that they'd be proceeding, and where there was no uh, proper funding model. And so uh, we have done, as part of our economically responsible position, uh, put uh, positions forward, but we continue uh, to negotiate and cooperate, just as we have the outstanding agreement that we have with Queensland on the Olympics, for example, uh, that we came to. So we'll continue to discuss between our infrastructure ministers, uh, but also between uh, myself and all of the premiers and chief ministers. Do you want to? Yeah, yeah. The um, extra money um, for the GST over three years, um, we absolutely um, welcome that. And in relation to the infrastructure, the Deputy Premier and the Federal uh, Commonwealth Infrastructure Minister continue to have those uh, conversations um, as they will continue for um, the months and uh, years ahead. Uh, yeah. Just here, and then I'll, I'll go there, and then I'll go over there. <laughs> Outline a dollar figure to the premiers and chief ministers today on how much that 50/50, uh, how much that additional uh, foundational supports will cost the states and territories. And just one for Premier Allen as well. Um, are you confident that the agreements, the funding agreements that were discussed today, will be enough to um, alleviate some of your budgetary pressures at the moment, and in particular regarding the NDIS? Uh, uh, yes, we were, and uh, we're working all them through and. They'll be in our budgets, but we agreed uh, today 50-50 uh, you know, funding foundation support going through, but that's capped as well, uh, to make sure that every state and territory uh, will be better off. Katina? Sorry, just Sorry. Uh, to respond as well. No, thank you. So today's been important from Victoria's perspective for a couple of key reasons, and the Prime Minister went to this in his opening remarks. By having that ongoing certainty for the next three years, or an extension on the GST arrangements for another three years, gives us that budget certainty from which we can continue to partner, whether it's with the Commonwealth on NDIS or health and hospital delivery, or on the suite of other services that we are responsible for delivering. And this is why the, the GST discussion was important to us for Victoria's point of view. Not having that extension of the, the GST arrangements would have not just been a hit to our budget, it would have also been a real issue in terms of the number of teachers and nurses we can employ and engage in our schools and hospitals. And I think I, I, this is my first National Cabinet and my, my first conversation with First Ministers, but the, a number of these issues today, these have been the best part of a decade in the making in terms of the challenges that have been mounting up. GST, the challenges with NDIS, the issues with health and hospital reform. And today we've not only got an agreement on the revenue base going forward, but we've got a reform agenda to fundamentally address some of the key issues that families rely on, both whether you're a person with a disability or someone ex uh, wanting to get the right health care in the right place at the right time. Thanks. Katina? Further on the NDIS foundational supports, um, can, can you or perhaps one of the Premiers give us a concrete idea about what it is we're actually talking about with those supports? Are they going to be the same in every state? Um, and also, just quickly, on the Medicare urgent care clinics, um, does the extra money mean more clinics or more money to the existing clinics? Um, it means more clinics. Uh, we will have the 58 that we promised urgent care clinics open uh, by the end of this year, as we promised to do so. And they are making an enormous difference. Every person who goes into an urgent care clinic is one less person in the emergency department of a hospital. Not only is that good for the hospitals and their workforce, it actually makes economic sense because it's more efficient, but importantly as well, it's good for the patient. So when little Johnny or Mary falls off their bike, instead of waiting for hours at an ED, because quite rightly for life-threatening cases, jump ahead, they get the care they need when they need it, and all they need is their Medicare card. This has been far more successful than we envisaged. That's the truth. It has made an enormous difference already, and uh, we're very proud, and that's why 
uh, we want to look at uh, extending it into some areas that haven't uh, currently got access to it. And uh, on the end... Yeah. They are, they will well, be the same put, put simply, that, that a, a range of uh, people have uh, disabilities. Uh, the NDIS was uh, designed uh, to support people with uh, permanent and significant disability. They need that care. Uh, they need that care desperately. Uh, but there are a range of other uh, people who who've still, currently not everyone with a disability or an issue uh, that, that uh, requires support, is in the NDIS now. Uh, but we need to make sure that uh, the legislation that we introduce, that we'll, we'll have discussions with states and territories is about, is so that the system remains sustainable. And, and that's what foundational support is about, the, the sort of support that uh, has uh, occurred for a long period of time before the NDIS uh, came around. Uh, the NDIS at the moment with its projections of where it was headed uh, was uh, simply not sustainable. That's something that's recognised uh, by uh, the sector. That doesn't mean, that does not mean uh, people who uh, who deserve and need to be on the NDIS. Uh, it doesn't mean any cuts. We're talking about an 8% growth uh, target as well. That's substantial for any area of social policy delivery. Sarah? I just wanted to ask, was eligibility in the NDIS discussed? Were you talking about people who are in the NDIS now being moved onto those foundational supports? Premier Allen, just yesterday, your disability minister said her understanding was that people would come off. Is that your understanding after this meeting? And if I may, to the WA... Hang, hang on. Whoa, 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 whoa. No, no, you don't get... People ask many questions. And I'm West yeah. Australian. I have to ask Roger one thing. Well... <laughs> one question for Roger, sorry, if I can. Um, I just want to ask you, you did say that you can't sign up to something where you don't know what the cost to the state is going to be regarding NDIS. So, to be clear, what is the cost to WA going to be? Well, we've, we've sought and received assurances from the Prime Minister that our contribution will be capped and um, it will be on the basis of uh, the, the establishment of the, the 50 uh, of the foundational uh, services. So we think it's a sensible way to go and um, we're looking forward to working with the Commonwealth in relation to the design of the foundational services, but also for the Treasurers to work on the funding model and approach for it. No. Yep. Well, it, it, <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to give everyone a go, and people have got to get planes, that's all. Yep. Uh, Prime Minister, one for sure. Jacinta Allen and one for yourself. Premier Allen, uh, the Ombudsman has described in Victoria a culture of fear in the public service. What's your reaction to that report that's come out today? And, Prime Minister, are you concerned that... Uh, given the political pressure that's been identified in that report by the Ombudsman will produce outcomes like robo-debt because bureaucrats are too scared to provide frank and fearless advice? Well, well let me, let's be clear on the, on the Ombudsman's report that has been released today. We'll obviously take our time to reflect on the report and consider the recommendations. But I want to make two points. The first is that the Ombudsman herself, in her report, points to this being the most intensive investigation in the, in the 50 years of the Office of the Ombudsman. It also went on to find that there was not one example, not one example of partisan political hiring in the Victorian public sector. So those other inferences that, that, that are being drawn by others, the speculation, the, uh, the, the, the frankly, the shade that's being thrown on a very, very good and strong public sector that we have in Victoria is not just deeply unfair, it's not founded in any evidence that's presented in the Ombudsman's report released today. Yep. Um, 
Jade? Sorry, um, just a couple more. Uh, just a further question for Premier Allen on the Victorian Ombudsman's report today. Um, it also shows that the Premier's office last year had 80 staff members, which is almost the same combined as the Prime Minister's office and the New South Wales Premier's office. How many staff do you currently have in your office and will you commit to revising that number down to similar levels of your other counterparts? So in response to some previous reports that have been um, tabled in the Victorian Parliament, we've made um, some in principle um, commitments to in terms of releasing additional detail on that. And as you can appreciate it, um, we are going through a period of transition with my office. We're in the process of engaging new staff. Staff are coming and going as we've had a change of uh, Premier in Victoria. So the final number is not settled. Uh, and I'd also note for completeness that I think different jurisdictions, you know, what's in and what's out is counted in very different ways, but we'll be reporting in due course on the, on the yeah, numbers. Just here. Prime Minister, you said that. Um, uh, sorry, yes, yeah, just at the front. You said that this does not mean that people who deserve to be on the NDIS will what? be removed from it. Sorry. D Okay. You, you just said that this agreement does not mean that people who deserve to be on the NDIS will be removed. Does this mean there are people who don't deserve to no. be on the scheme? And was eligibility discussed? No. It means that we are looking at the NDIS review will be released tomorrow. This is about capping growth at 8 per cent. Growth at 8 per cent. Here. You Last ran one. your election campaign about the pressure on schools and teachers. With this foundational support, the, the PM flagged it could be delivered through schools and childcare settings. Are you concerned this adds another burden onto already overworked teachers? Well, look, we're concerned about the growth of the NDIS, and there's a recognition from First Ministers today that we all have to do something about it. Now the hard work begins. But I think that if you look at the NDIS, the GST, uh, if you look at changes to health reform, I think we've achieved more in the last two days than many That's thought right. would be possible, and it gives the state certainty in relation to the GST and the health system so that we can tackle challenges in the NDIS. And that's a breakthrough that First Ministers and previous Prime Ministers have been aiming for for over a decade. Health reform, disability reform, National Firearms Registry, this has been a very significant meeting. Thanks very much. Thank you.